Shalom and good evening. I'm Jonathan Hessen, and this is yet another edition of TV7 Editor's Note. And today I have a special guest with me, my dear friend all the way from Zagreb, Croatia, is the former foreign minister of Croatia, Mr. Miro Kovac, who is, of course, familiar to you at home uh, from our Europa Stands panels, uh, which obviously we uh, will air once more in the near future on October 1st, if I'm not mistaken. So stay tuned for that. We have a very lively discussion coming up ahead. Uh, Miro, thank you so very much for taking out of your busy schedule to partake. Thank you for inviting me and uh, I am uh, uh, looking forward to having a nice discussion with you. And I also greet very much uh, the uh, spectators of your, uh, of your show. I appreciate that. Well, uh, in uh, editor's note, as we always do, we start with a brief prayer, and then we'll immediately dive into a, a long list of topics that I think that uh, should be discussed, and uh, if you may all join me as well. Thank you, Lord, for today, Father. Thank you for the blessing and privilege of being able to be joined all the way from Zagreb by my dear friend Milo Kovac. Uh, Lord, I pray that our discussion will be uh, fruitful and will serve as a blessing to our viewers all over the world. We do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Mr. Kovac, I'd like to start with uh, highlighting, actually, uh, the fact that Croatia is regarded by Israel as one of the champions of support within the context of the Eurozone, of the European Union institution for that matter, you happened to be the first Croatian official, senior official, to visit Israel since Croatia's accession into the European institution. And uh, it seems like those relations have only become stronger over the years. Uh, just recently, on the 29th of May of this year, Israeli Foreign Minister Eli Cohen visited Croatia, during which uh, there were various discussions. It was a fruitful endeavor, particularly about the need to further bolster uh, Israeli-Croatian uh, relations on matters of energy, tourism, economy, and innovation. What can you tell us a little bit about this unique relationship? I can tell you that you're perfectly right uh, with your description. So our relationship is very rich, uh, very friendly. And I really happen to be the first foreign minister after Croatia joined the Union in 2013 to visit Israel. And I had also the, the, the honor and the pleasure at that time to meet not only uh, my colleagues uh, uh, in different uh, ministries in Israel, but also to meet the then uh, prime minister and foreign minister, uh, Mr. Netanyahu. It was a very good meeting. And as you perfectly uh, described, uh, since then, our relations have only become better. So, um, strategically, we have a strong cooperation when it comes to security affairs, when it comes to political affairs. What we could do more is to enhance our economic cooperation even more. I think a lot of space in that domain. When it comes to strategic cooperation, I very much... Um, uh, like and support uh, Israel's understanding for the situation of the cross in neighboring Bosnia Herzegovina. And uh, we also have a very strong investment from Israel in Mostar, which is uh, the uh, capital of Herzegovina, a city w in which you have uh, Bosnian Muslims, Bosniaks, and Croats. And uh, we know that the strongest uh, football team in Bosnia and Herzegovina, a neighboring country, with uh, the Croats as one of the three peoples, being constituent peoples, the football club Zrinski being the best club, and also supported financially by the company uh, in which Israeli money is present. So we have a good cooperation. It could become even more strong in economic affairs. But when, when it comes to Israel, uh, understanding Israel, supporting Israel in any respect, in every respect, Croatia will stand very firm. It's a clear, rational position of the Croatian authorities. 
indeed. Of course, uh, during that meeting that you spoke about with uh, the then Prime Minister and currently, of course, also Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, he also highlighted the need to combat anti-Semitism, uh, which has been uh, also on the top of your agenda at the time within uh, EU member states, uh, something that Croatia has been uh, very... Uh, very impressive, uh, to say the least, uh, in the context of uh, various challenges that arise throughout Europe. Croatia has been among those that really stood up and, and faced uh, the challenge. It, it, it is a, unfortunately, it is a common plague still today throughout the world, which we have to combat very fiercely. And this is what we're doing in Croatia. Indeed. Well, let's move to, uh, you spoke about the need to enhance uh, bilateral cooperation, particularly on the economic front. Uh, obviously, Croatia has faced uh, a number of challenges, uh, uh, particularly on the economic front. It's uh, recorded the second worst inflation rate just last month in August uh, with 8.5% uh, uh, inflation as opposed to the 53 uh, average uh, throughout the European Union uh, or the Eurozone for that matter. Let's face it, the, the world is seeing a slowdown, it's seeing inflation rates rising, uh, the the printing of money in, in America and, and elsewhere has not helped, uh, to say the least. Uh, we see that uh, cost of living is rising, people are not necessarily making more money, and they need still to pay the bills, which uh, it, it is a challenge not only in Croatia, but everywhere. What can be done differently? So basically, when we speak about inflation, it's a problem throughout Europe. In the eurozone as you mentioned correctly right now in croatia the inflation rate is quite high uh, in the first half of this year it was uh, it was different not as high as in august at the same time our growth rate is uh, uh, something like 2.4 percent 2.2 percent higher than in france higher than in germany so when we speak about economic data we should talk, take into account also the growth rate, not only the inflation rate. So things are quite complex. What is good for Croatia is that this year we had a lot of tourists, uh, also tourists from Israel. Mm. So in that respect, things are going in the right direction. Uh, what we uh, could do more efficiently is to attract uh, investment in, uh, in industry. Uh, now having joined the uh, Eurozone uh, in January this year, having become a member of the Schengen Zone, meaning that we can travel freely throughout Europe uh, without showing our passports or identity cards, it should be also a motivation, a stimulation for um, our partners from other European member states, countries from member states to invest in Croatia. When you look at how things are developing, our standard of living is uh, rising, fortunately. And today we are at 73% of the average of the European Union. Some years ago we were at 65%, 66%. So things are changing, perhaps uh, not fast enough. But uh, uh, honestly speaking, I'm an optimist. I think if we adapt certain structures in Croatia more efficiently, that we could move ahead uh, uh, more quickly. I think two points that uh, I should highlight from what you just said, and, and that is uh, very important to note. Personally, I think that Croatia is one of the most beautiful countries in Europe. And that is something that when we're talking about tourism, it is one of the favorite attractions for Israelis. And I do encourage you, if you ever think about traveling in Europe, Croatia is, is one of those countries that are worth uh, visiting, also a very rich history. But uh, nonetheless, uh, I do think that the root cause of joining Schengen is economic in nature. Obviously, there are various merits that uh, freedom of, of travel is, is obviously a very uh, substantive added value for all of us. But it comes at certain costs of security, of being able to monitor who comes in and out of your country, and therefore it should have the value or the return of that uh, uh, challenge 
in order to bolster the capacity of, of Croatia, which is uh, a land of very hardworking people. So uh, that is uh, an understatement when I say that. Let's move uh, to challenges that we discuss on a regular basis. And I think that uh, have quite the dire impact, not only on continental Europe, obviously on the whole world, but also Israel in particular, and that is Ukraine. Uh, just uh, recently, the Ukrainians have managed to break through uh, one of the uh, defense lines of uh, the Russians, seeing some progress as opposed to uh, long overdue attempts that uh, failed time and again. Uh, now the Ukrainians are seeing that it's mounting the pressure on, on Russia. Do we see this as a window of opportunity to potentially either drive a certain diplomatic push that would allow to see this conflict, which is quite bloody in, in uh, no uncertain terms, uh, being able to somehow see a solution that would be both justifiable for Europe as well as for Ukraine, but also for the entire world, since this war is impacting each and every one of us, uh, not only uh, impacting the inflation rates, among others, but also beyond that, the grain deals that everybody are speaking about, of course, have implications for the entire Middle East, for Europe, for Poland, uh, for that matter. Uh, and then, of course, the Russians. Can they come to terms with a reality in which they are not necessarily seen as the victors in this scenario? So um, this is what we have today, uh, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. The um, aggression of uh, Russia against Ukraine is a conflict between uh, Russia and the West. That is clear. And it was uh, uh, already the case uh, nine years ago when Russia uh, attacked Ukraine for the first time. Uh, my uh, conviction is that uh, at that time, speaking about the West, meaning the US and the European Union, Europe as such, we uh, did not act wisely enough. What we should have done immediately is to send on the request of the Ukrainians peace forces to Ukraine. If that had been done, there wouldn't have been a second aggression of Russia against Ukraine. So this is my, 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 my conviction. So strategically, and I said in the US in 2015, at a conference of the European People's Party, and Mr. Pompeo was there too, and I said, this is a mistake. We should have sent peace forces to Ukraine on the request of the Ukrainians things would have looked differently today. Okay, so that, that is history. Now let's look into the future. The Ukrainians, they fight courageously. We provide them with weapons, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, necessary. Without the weapons from the West, without the money from the US and from the European Union, Ukraine would not survive in this conflict. It would be impossible. The GDP of Ukraine in 2021, before it uh, was attacked by Russia, was equivalent to the BDP of the of, to the GDP, excuse me, of the state of Berlin in Germany, which has 3.8 million inhabitants. So the GDP was something like 167 billion euros in 2021, equivalent to the GDP of the state of Berlin. Okay, So without the help from the West, Ukraine wouldn't be able to resist. So the Ukrainians, how I see things, they have already achieved a big thing. 80% of the territory is controlled by Kiev, 80%. So there's already a big success. Today we speak about the possibility of Ukraine joining the European Union. It's going to happen in 7, 10, 15 years, we don't know. But it is clear for us in the European Union that we want them with us. It was unthinkable a year ago, two years ago. So and if we look at things 
from that angle, it is already a success story for Ukraine to have resisted so courageously and kept the control of 80% of the national territory. So, of course, the Ukrainians will continue to fight. The Russians will continue to fight. And we will see if there will be any negotiations going on. We don't know. We will still support Ukrainians who want to get back their territory. But at the same time, I don't see how the Russians will stop uh, fighting in Ukraine. Next year, we will have elections in, in Russia in, uh, in the spring. Mr. Putin will most probably once again run for president, so he will stay president of Russia. Uh, we will have elections in the U.S. next year. Um, will the U.S. continue to support um, Ukraine uh, like it has done so far? We very much hope so. Uh, but uh, I would look at things differently and present them differently. This is already a big success for the Ukrainians to control 80% of its territory because it is fighting not against a small state. It is fighting against Russia in nuclear power, a former superpower. So a superpower having the support uh, of China. Uh, we see that things are changing the world. We see the G20 meeting with a declaration where Russia is not identified as the aggressor. So things are changing in the world. And so if we look at things from that angle, we can speak right now, today, of Ukraine as a country which has which marked a big success. But it will, of course, continue to fight. But the most of the territory has been safeguarded by the Ukrainian authorities. And sometimes things take time. <coughs> Germany attacked France, Prussia in 8070. It took Alsace and Lorraine. And it took the French 50 years to take it back. So I very much hope, like you, that it will not take 50 years for Ukraine to take back the territories which are right now controlled by the Russians. But we have to look at things uh, uh, smartly, and we have to look at things uh, constructively. And right now, Ukraine is still in possession of 80% of its territory, and it has a big territory, and is a country with a big perspective. If uh, the social life is organized in an efficient manner, if the economic life is if, uh, organized in an efficient manner, it can be a big economic, political, and military hub in, in a unified, in an enlarged Europe. I think one of the key challenges of Ukraine is domestic issues, and, and that is something that ultimately it will have to resolve. Uh, one of another angle that, that is challenges it is obviously that Zelensky's mandate is uh, based on its promise to regain all those territories and unfortunately in the age of TikTok, people are not as patient uh, when we're talking about doing various strategies and, and implementing them. Uh, patience is a virtue, as you note, uh, things take time and, and people should not be immediate. However, when we're talking about Ukraine, particularly, as you say, it's lifespan in this conflict is based on the support of the United States, particularly, and Europe, whether it be EU member states or uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, it seems like Ukraine does not have uh, the, the capacity or particularly not the will by its elites who have uh, probably more capabilities to wage such a war uh, to put the money where it's necessary. But let's move one step backwards and look at the situation. Also, in, your, in Russia, we just had several days ago the municipal elections in Russia. We saw that all the people who were elected were Putin supporters, uh, including, of course, in areas where uh, initially they had certain candidates which were more critical towards 
Putin's policies were disqualified uh, for various reasons. But during times of war, much of those uh, activities are regarded as legitimate within Russian society. So if we look at a holistic approach and we hear the voices coming out from Washington, coming out from Berlin, from Brussels, from other places, everybody notes that the end result of the conflict should be decided by Ukraine. However, if the lifeline and the finances that are dedicated to Ukraine are taken out of the equation, it's not entirely a legitimate statement to make because the ones who who are supposed to follow through on that are the leaders of Western Europe. So uh, my feeling is, and this is also what I see, what I hear, that uh, the European Union member states, the most important ones, the biggest ones, uh, the US, the UK, Canada, uh, basically the NATO member uh, countries, uh, they will uh, continue to support Ukraine. They will continue to support Ukraine because the conflict is not only about Russia and Ukraine. It is a conflict between uh, the West and Russia. This is what it's about. And uh, the West, and this is my personal conviction, has to be very smart in understanding that the world is changing and that it has to reorganize itself efficiently to be still the dominant sphere uh, in, in the world. So if, um, if the European Union states, if the member, NATO member states uh, decided hypothetically to uh, uh, slow down when it comes to supporting Ukraine, it would be a disaster, not only for Ukraine, it would be a disaster for, for the West. So once we started to support Ukraine, we are compelled to continue to do so. Otherwise, we have a problem of legitimacy. Uh, even today, there are, spec there, there are simulations which are done by uh, not only by government agencies but also by institutes uh, around the world how uh, the americans would react in the case of a chinese attack against taiwan so if the west now shows once the war was started by the russians and we show it clear that we will support ukraine if we now stop supporting Ukraine, the Chinese will logically deduce from that that we will not support Taiwan. Not supporting Taiwan means that the whole Pacific agenda of the West, of the US, falls apart. So we have a, uh, this is today a, a, a big struggle, a confrontation between the West Russia and China. China supporting Russia, of course, because of China having the ambition to become a regional hegemon. And uh, so we are compelled to support Ukraine. But that's why I'm saying we have to change our perspective. We have to continue to, to support Ukraine because we want the Ukrainians to get back their territory. But we should, right now, speak differently. We should say Ukraine has, in a way, already won because it is there. It exists. It wasn't subjugated. It controls 80% of its territory. So once you look at things from that angle, things look differently. But if you only speak about Ukraine, uh, now being compelled to get back the territories as quick as as quickly as possible, of course you have a problem. You have a problem of uh, with your arguments. You have too many expectations. Expectations you can hardly fulfill. I I, I love uh, to hear what Mr. Uh, Milley is saying, the general, 
the the the, uh, the um, chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. What is he saying? It's going to be a very tough war. It will take time. The Ukrainians can make it, but it will take time. It's very difficult. So we have to be realistic and change our perspective. Ukraine is free. Ukraine is already free. Indeed. Moldova will also be with us in the European Union one day. It was unthinkable some years ago. We were mm. laughing at that possibility. Today, it looks possible. We listened to Mrs. von der Leyen and her uh, Germans will say Sonntagsrede. Huh? Okay, mm. but still, she said clearly, we want the European Union with 30 and more members. Something like that, some years ago, Mr. Juncker, when he was president of the European Commission, he was against enlargement. Uh, so 10 years later, we have we are pro enlargement. Mm -hmm. Even uh, even countries like the Netherlands have become much more open to enlargement, which was hardly thinkable two, three, four years ago. So things are changing, and we have to understand that the European Union, as such, has also has the uh, uh, has to change because we are right now not able to ensure peace and stability alone on the European continent. We depend upon the goodwill, upon the strategic will of our American allies, of our American friends. And Absolutely. yesterday, when Mrs. von der Leyen spoke in the European Parliament, she did not mention the need to establish quickly the European defense community. So with European armed forces, which would be a part of NATO. So we have to get much more uh, 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 prepared in Europe, in the European Union, to take care of the European continent, and then to combine forces with our American friends, Canadian friends, British friends, uh, inside NATO, to uphold the importance uh, of the West in the world, in the global commons. Indeed. Well, uh, this is all the time that we have for today, unfortunately. It's uh, been a, truly a pleasure. I'm looking forward to seeing you in Helsinki uh, and uh, encourage all of our viewers, of course, to uh, stay tuned on uh, the 1st of October. We will air once again Europa Stands. Milo Kovac, former foreign minister of Croatia, thank you so very much. Thank you very much. All the best to you and to your spectators. Absolutely, and I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until the next time, from here in Jerusalem, Shalom.